Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. So we're here again for an, a new session of our webinars on reproducible research. So today we have the pleasure to, to welcome Pierre Dragicevic uh, from uh, Inria Saclay in the IPS team and whose main um, uh, fields of interest are human computer interaction and information visualization. And so that's great because so far we had almost nothing regarding uh, visualization and analysis of experiments and things like that, which are pretty important. Uh, so the principle is the same for those of us, f for those of you who are um, following the, um, the conference uh, remotely. If you go on the GitHub web page, uh, you'll see there is a pad, okay, where you can uh, ask questions. Uh, for so f if you want me to ask questions to Pierre, then I will just ask ask it for you. Okay. Thanks yeah. again, Pierre. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for everyone for coming. And yeah, so my talk and Yvonne's talk after me will be about statist statist I mean not statistical analysis, but more about experiments in behavioral sciences, which include a. Uh, information visualization and uh, human computer interaction, but also many other domains like psychology uh, from which we can learn a lot. And my talk uh, will be more specifically about statistical uncertainty. It's a topic I've been interested in and in how to communicate statistics. And uh, so how we're not very good at this and how we can improve, um, for example, by watching very simple simulations. So you will see, uh, for those who are in the room, you will see in Yvonne's talk after me that uh, sometimes there are some uh, findings that are wrong in uh, behavioral sciences or exaggerating and that those uh, wrong or exaggerated findings uh, will often lead to wrong recommendations and uh, sometimes persist in the scientific literature. Uh, and uh, we, we knew this for, oh, that's interesting. So apparently it's not very stable. Yeah, we've been knowing this for, for a while. Uh, more than 10 years ago, there is this famous paper from Ioannidis, maybe you know about this paper. And he showed that uh, under some reasonable assumptions, probably more than half of uh, all published research in um, psychology and medicine is probably wrong. Um, and this seems a bit sensational, but this was confirmed more recently in a also famous paper where more than 200 sci uh, scientists, psychologists, replicated um, 100 psychology studies and found that uh, more than half of them uh, couldn't replicate. So there are many reasons, and this is sometimes called the, the, the uh, replication crisis in psychology. And there are many reasons uh, why this is the case. There are many problems. Uh, and we have to deal with them one by one. And today I will focus on the fact that we are generally not very good uh, at um, understanding and communicating the uncertainty in our statistical analysis. And this topic actually I've been interested for several years now. I gave several talks where I tried to explain uh, why uh, moving beyond traditional uh, methods, traditional procedures in statistics can uh, improve things. And I also wrote a book chapter about this. If you're interested, you can visit this website. Here I will not talk about this. Uh, first, because uh, uh, people are starting to get uh, tired of uh, listening to me repeating the same things over and over again. And also because uh, I've noticed around me and elsewhere that even when people switch to better procedures for statistical analysis, they keep, often they keep making some of the same interpretation mistakes. So uh, the goal of this talk here uh, is to uh, step back a little bit and try to understand what it is that we're doing wrong uh, independently from the uh, tools we're using, the statistical tools. And I think the answer is very well captured by this recent quote from a famous uh, applied statistician, uh, Andrew Gelman. Statistics has been described as the science of uncertainty, but paradoxically, uh, statistical methods are often used to create a sense of certainty when none should exist. So this is clearly the case. It's clearly a big problem. And why is it the case? 
One reason is that we hate uncertainty. Um, we prefer certainty and our reviewers even more so. And, uh, but another reason is that even if we try our, our best, it's very difficult to understand the uncertainty in our statistical analysis. It's very hard. And so we need better, um, not only more training, but better educational material to help us understand as researchers. And there is a pedagogical tool that's very powerful, I find, that uh, I call statistical dance. And this has been first used, probably not first, but this has been certainly uh, Jeff Cumming popularized this idea by showing that uh, p-values and confidence intervals uh, vary a lot across uh, multiple hypothetical replications of the same experiment. And in this talk, I will show that we can learn a lot. Uh, it can be very informative to generalize this approach and illustrate uh, other types of uh, statistical dances. And that will be mostly, my talk will be about that for the most part. So the outline is uh, in the title. First, I will show why no statistical analysis is reliable. And then I will uh, discuss what to do about it. So I will start with the most simple dance, the dance that many uh, researchers know about already. Um, it's the dance of the sample means. So let's assume that as uh, HCI researchers, we just invented a great uh, way of selecting items in the menu. And we implemented two different uh, versions, two variants, variant one and variant two. And we want to show that they work better than uh, the baseline, which is a traditional menu. So what do we do? We find uh, N participants. We show them uh, the three techniques. We, we ask them to perform tasks with the three techniques. We measure time and we look at overall, on average, how faster uh, participants are compared to the baseline, baseline using variant one and variant two. Okay, so the, those are the two effect sizes I'm interested in, the difference in mean completion time between uh, variant one and the baseline and between variant two and the baseline. So now let's assume that we run the experiment, we get these results. Okay, we see that, oh, okay, it's great because overall, uh, on average, uh, variant one, people are faster by 11.4 seconds using variant one. And they're still better with variant two, but only by 2.1 seconds. So um, I think most of us know already that uh, you cannot publish a paper with just this information. Let's see why. So I will first, I will zoom out the y-axis. Those are still the same values, it's just zoomed out. Let's see where those two means come from. So each of these means comes from an averaging over those black dots. So on the left, every black dot is the data from one participant. It's um, how much this participant, on average, how faster this participant was with variant one, and on the right with variant two. So uh, we have a total of here uh, 16 participants. OK, every participant saw all the three techniques. So every participant contributes a dot on the left and a dot on the right. So we have 16 dots on the left, 16 dots on the right. And the bars you see on the right are averages. OK, so what we can see is that um, there is a trend, but there, there is also lots of noise. Uh, for some, some participants were slower with our techniques, actually. So let's see what this implies really in practice by uh, uh, running a, a dance of sample means. So how do we do that? To do that, we need to run hypothetical uh, replications of this experiment. And this is easy because this is already a hypothetical experiment. I generated this data. It's very easy. So the model is very simple. All dots on the left are uh, randomly drawn from a distribution centered at 10 seconds normal distribution, and the dots on the right are drawn from normal distribution centered at zero seconds. So in reality, variant one is really better across the whole population, but the variant two is the same as the baseline. Of course, the researcher doesn't know that. But okay, let's simulate a replica replication by drawing two new samples. Okay, we have slightly different dots on the left, slightly different means. Variant one is still better. Variant two is still is even better than before. Okay, it's, it's even better. So let's do it again. Oh, okay, this time uh, variant one is not so impressive, and variant two is a bit slower. And I can do that over and over again. And so those are successive uh, uh, replications, and we can see how the means uh, bounce around it. So this is the dance of the sample means. 
let's zoom let's take the initial plot that's zoomed in version okay so you can see this changes changes quite a lot um, and here let's look at the uh, real effect sizes so the population means which of course the researcher doesn't know about what the as a researcher what we can do is only run a single experiment which means essentially which means closing your eyes and taking a random plot from the infinite sequence of plot of which we just saw a subset and this is the only plot you have you don't know the population uh, means you don't know the the rest of the dance so knowing that it's quite clear that if you get this plot knowing that uh, it, um, the values could, could have been very different you shouldn't trust uh, those sample means nothing new about that really it's something we all learn in any uh, in any very basic statistics uh, class so okay so we know it's not enough what do we what should we do we should do inferential statistics usually this is by computing p-values uh, here those are the p-values for the null hypothesis of no effect the, the hypothesis that the techniques are all the same and uh, roughly speaking uh, the lower a p-value the more evidence against this null hypothesis so the more evidence that there's actually a difference uh, this is not the only interpretation of p-values but this is the original interpre interpretation from uh, Fisher so uh, the p-value on the left is generally considered as uh, very low so we have strong evidence that uh, variant one is different uh, actually uh, better but uh, the p-value on the right is is considered that as almost no evidence at all for a difference so it kind of works <laughs> here but uh, we should remember that p-values in that case are nothing else than a function of sample size which is constant in the dense and of the sample mean and the sample to standard deviation we already saw that the sample means dances across replications the sample standard deviation also dances so uh, it's kind of it's only natural to assume that p-values will dance across replications too so let's see uh, to what extent we'll first move the p-values on the right I will do a separate plot uh, the higher a bar, the lower the p-value, so the stronger the evidence. Okay, so uh, green bar on the uh, green bar, like on the left, means that there is evidence. Uh, um, red bar, like on the right, means there is no evidence. Sorry for um, people who are colorblind, but you can also look at the height of the bars. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so let's draw another. Let's simulate the application by drawing another random uh, sample. So okay, now uh, the p-value is uh, much less impressive for variant one. It's still no result for variant two. Let's do it again. Oh, now super results for variant one, and also some significant. Uh, I mean, some good p-value for variant two. This is definitely a paper that you can publish. Uh, that will maybe be your best paper. So let's keep, uh, you know, uh, simulating replications. I can see that the, the, it's kind of crazy. The p-values change a lot; they bounce around a lot, and this is not a weird case scenario. I will more about this later. So this is uh, well known. Um, there is you can, for example, read this paper uh, by Jeff Cumming. By the way, I don't know if you saw before, but there was it was indicated on the slide that you can look at all references at there is a URL where, where you can check the references. Okay, let me go back to this. Sorry, it's here on the top right. So if you see an interesting reference, you can just uh, directly download the paper. Uh, so www.avis.fr slash dances. Sorry for this interruption, I forgot to mention. Let's go back. So yeah, so there is this work showing more, you know, theoretical work on the left, which shows that uh, p-values are very unreliable, they uh, vary a lot uh, across replication but most importantly there is also empirical evidence that researchers are very bad uh, at uh, they don't know that really and they tend to underestimate the variability of p-values they tend to trust p-values too much and I was really surprised to see that this was true not only for researchers in psychology but also for researchers in, in uh, medicine and even in uh, statistics
you can check this paper if you're interested. So again, uh, every time you get p-values, don't forget they come from a random dance. Uh, so yes, p-values are very useful. They're certainly more informative than just the sample means. They're a very good indication, but you shouldn't take them uh, too seriously. Okay, and actually, p-values have uh, some other problems, uh, drawbacks. Uh, for example, they are not very informative. And so they're not the most uh, intuitive way of conveying the uncertainty in your data. A more intuitive way is by conveying the uncertainty around your sample means, which you can do with standard errors, uh, and even better using 95% confidence intervals. Uh, this is another classical representation for confidence interval. It's easier to read. Uh, you can get rid of those bars and use dots instead. So very roughly speaking, this is not a real definition. We'll see the re real definition later, but a good approximation of confidence interval is that they give you the range of plausible values for the population mean. Uh, those are plausible values for the real difference between the, the my technique and the baseline. And so it's easy to see that for variant one, uh, zero and all negative values are implausible. So my technique is probably better, but it's not the case on the right. right? So this is consistent with what we saw with p-values, uh, but with more information because it doesn't only focus on how likely is zero as, a, as an effect, as a true effect. So now, um, remember that uh, those dots are the sampling means, right? And we know that they're bouncing around. So the confidence intervals will also bounce around. But also their length will also vary because the um, uh, sample standard deviation also uh, changes across replications. And you can see that here. So um, they bounce around quite a lot, actually. So here, those are the true uh, means. Um, each confidence interval will contain the true mean only 95% of the time. So this is the, the definition. And uh, so again, uh, when you get this type of plot, don't uh, keep in mind that this is a random one from this infinite sequence. So that confidence intervals are really, uh, they provide really important information, but you, should, you shouldn't take them too seriously. Uh, so don't trust them either. Uh, there is no point, for example, reporting confidence intervals uh, with uh, you know, up to uh, three decimal places and drawing uh, uh, conclusions about you know, where, where those uh, endpoints, where those limits uh, happen to end. Uh, just in case you thought that we Bayesian uh, uh, statistics could save us. It's not really the case. Um, those are the uh, those are Bayesian credible intervals and posterior distributions for uh, the same data with uh, weakly informed uh, priors. Uh, they are quite similar to the 95% confidence intervals. It's often the case in simple cases, and uh, they are also dense um, as much. In that case, we'll see more later about that. But so again, this is what you would get if you analyze the data using a Bayesian estimation approach. It's really informative, especially those posterior distributions are really useful because uh, they really let you interpret your data in, in a more nuanced way than those binary confidence intervals. But uh, you shouldn't trust them more <laughs> than the rest. OK, let, let's get back to p-values quickly. So uh, p-values are a means for testing hypotheses. There is a more rigorous way of doing that. It's called Bayesian uh, base factors. With base factors, uh, you can uh, compare two uh, competing hypotheses. So here, uh, it's the hypothesis that my technique is better with the hypothesis that it's worse than the baseline. And comparing the amount of evidence for those two hypotheses. So um, if uh, the base factor is much higher than one, like on the left, then I have good evidence that uh, my technique is better. If the base factor is close to one, like on the right, I don't know. Okay, I don't have enough data to decide. And if the base factor is much less than one, I have strong evidence by that my technique is uh, worse. Okay, so it's slightly different than the p-value, not that different, but considered a better approach, and it is. But it, it doesn't, it dances as well, right? So uh, 
it's even if it's if it's more rigorous way, uh, better way of, of uh, testing hypotheses, there is no reason to trust those base factors uh, and report them at up to three decimal places either. So I it's I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, all those errors propagate propagate they propagate. So for example, every um, every value you compute by using a statistical analysis like a p-value, a base factor, will propagate to the plots, right? And if you use plots or even the initial value to draw uh, conclusions, you will have errors in your conclusion too. You cannot avoid that, right? So we can imagine um, actually a dense of, uh, of papers, right? So you can imagine how your different uh, hypothetical, uh, hypothetical replications could have given different papers. And actually, we did that for fun in an Altkai uh, publication where we imagined uh, different papers. Um, we wrote different papers for, different for the same experiment, but uh, where the only difference was the random sample that we got. And the discussion is different, and sometimes the conclusions and the recommendations uh, are different too. So what we learned is that everything dances, so not only descriptive statistics like sample means, but also inferential statistics, all of them, they propagate. Your paper, there is some error in the paper, and people, I mean, can also imagine even a dance of papers that cite your paper. Uh, and there is no way around it. Or, I mean, there are sort of ways, and, uh, but it's not easy, and that will be the second part of my talk. And I will uh, start with the with which uh, uh, with what I think is the worst solution um, to discretize or dichotomize the results of your statistical analysis. So let's get back to p-values. There is something that people like to do uh, to help them interpret p-values. They set a threshold, 0 0.05, arbitrary but conventional threshold, and they consider they, they label everything that's below as significant and everything that's above this threshold as uh, non-significant. So um, there are problems with this one is that you're throwing away lots of data. And actually, it, do it doesn't really help stabilize the dance. Why? Because yes, I mean, two p-values that are on the same side of the, of the threshold will look exactly the same. So that's good. But if you have two p-values that are on either side and not so far away, they will look very, very different because we interpret significant results very differently than non-significant results. So, here is the dance. It, it, this doesn't stabilize the dance. It only makes it uh, more jerky, right, and throws away information. And there are other problems with uh, this um, practice. Uh, like, uh, it, uh, for example, it makes you think uh, dichotomously about the results. So it, it's not a um, it's not a very good, st good uh, tool for thinking, uh, for statistical thinking. Also, um, it's uh, one of the causes of uh, p-hacking and uh, um, replication bias, so publication bias that Yvonne will mention. So my recommendation is don't do this. There is one, uh, one thing for which this approach is useful is uh, to uh, think about different statistical errors. So here, for example, I took, a pl I took a plot from the dance where I was very unlucky because I got two uh, for wrong results. So on the uh, right, for variant two, I got a significant result. And I know there is no difference, right? So it's called a type one error. It happens 5% of the time in the dense if my uh, alpha value is 0 0.05. On the left, I got a non-significant result despite knowing that um, my technique is better. This is called a type two error. Uh, it, it depends on the, the rate, depends on the experiment. But here, in my case, for my simulations, it happens 30% of the time. And so we say that we have statistical power of 0 0.7. So just in case you thought that I took some weird examples just to make a point, uh, statistical power of 0 0.7 is considered not bad at all. It's actually uh, higher than the average in, average in psychology and probably also in HCI, So which means that when you actually run an experiment uh, in HCI, it means that you are taking a result from a dance that's probably as wide as the ones we saw here, or even wider. 
Okay, so there is another thing that we can do. We can use confidence intervals and observe whether they contain zero or not, and then label results as significant or non-significant. This is the same as uh, uh, looking at the p-value, whether it's less, more or less than 0 0.05. So it's exactly the same, so the dense will be the same if you ignore the confidence intervals. So I would suggest not doing this for the same reasons as before. Base factors too, so sometimes people help, uh, they like using threshold to help them uh, interpret the base factors. So base factor of more than 10 or less than uh, 1 over 10 is considered strong evidence. So I could do this, right, and decide, okay, uh, we'll decide that everything above 10 is, is good enough evidence and everything below is not. Uh, uh, this dense is too, right? This doesn't solve the dense problem. Uh, so, and uh, there's actually, uh, Daniel Lakens wrote a blog post last year explaining uh, why it's not a good idea to use those thresholds when interpreting base factors. And he used actually uh, the statistical, uh, the statistical dense argument. So, yeah, I would suggest not doing this. So, there is a better solution, use larger samples. So, this is the original sample size, 16. Uh, so you can see the dense of the p-values and of the Bayesian intervals. But I can double the, choose to double the sample size, 32, and I will double it again and again. So what we observe that is that the intervals are the on the right are much smaller and the dense less. Okay? We can also see that for variant 1, for which we know there is an effect, all the p-values are very low. Right? There is very strong evidence. Uh, for the variant 2, actually, it's the same uh, type 1 error 5% of the time, this doesn't change. But what I can do knowing that is that I can change the alpha level, I can be more demanding and set it to a lower value. If I do that with such a sample size, I will have a low type 1 error rate and I will, have, I will keep a very low type 2 error rate. So it kind of works here. It's, the situation is quite good. But still, remember that you can never entirely stabilize the dense. So here, for example, those intervals still dense a bit. And actually, the dense in the same proportion relative to their length. So nothing can be ever uh, certain. So large samples are good. But there are limitations. More participants stabilize the dense only slowly. So to get uh, intervals twice as small and to have them dense twice half as uh, you know, to reduce the amplitude by half of the dense, you need to square the number of participants. And running participants, we all know that it can be very costly. So many statis uh, statisticians will say, yeah, just, you know, use a large power. But if you really run the experiment, you realize that it's not that easy. And one of the reasons is that if you use many more participants, you will have less, there are less research questions that will, you will be able to answer. So it's a question of how to allocate participants to research questions. So there is a complicated trade-off here. Also, increasing uh, number of uh, the sample size is not the only way. It's not even the more most effective way of increasing uh, statistical power. You can in increase it by better measurement, for example. So another solution that's not that kind of works is using informed priors in, uh, in the Bayesian estimation. Uh, we're not going to do into details here, but just enough to keep in mind that um, using informed priors don't change a lot. I mean, on the right, we have, very, we have strongly informed priors. The intervals are a bit smaller. They bounce around a bit less, but not that much. So it's good. It's good to do that, but we need very, very strong priors to really stabilize the dance of uh, Bayesian intervals. And we all know that, uh, to, I mean, <laughs> probably many of us know that uh, strong priors are assuming that you're replicating an experiment because you need a previous experiment to, um, um, to, to inform your priors. And uh, replications are rare in HCI. So I think the real problem and that we need to address is that there, there is maybe a lack of appreciation by researchers about the uncertainty in their statistical analysis. Okay, I think we are all very familiar with the dense of the sample means. Everyone knows that, we learned that it's in the textbooks, but 
somehow we overestimate the reliability of p-value statistical tests and interval estimate. So there is this sort of magic thinking. We think that statistics are kind of magic because they will stabilize. They will turn, basically, they will turn uh, uncertainty into certainty. And statistics cannot really do that. And it's hard to overcome this wrong intuition. And so that's why those simulations of hypothetical replications are very useful. The solutions are, of course, better education, but also more willingness from, uh, willingness from uh, researchers to learn by themselves and run uh, simulations by themselves. But also, of course, we need new principles about uh, how to interpret our data. We need uh, some form of guidance that everyone can understand and new principles. So there is one uh, principle that I talk about a bit in my chapter which I call the robustness principle. It's not a good word because robust is already used in statistics to mean something else, but <laughs> bear with me. Uh, so I refer to a robust uh, analysis. I mean, uh, I'm saying a statistical analysis is robust to sampling variability if two similar data sets uh, give two similar results. So you can apply this to plots, for example. Good plots are robust. Uh, if you use a good plot, then two similar data sets we will give two plots that are visually similar. And it's the same for interpretations. So a way of interpreting results can be robust or not robust to uh, sampling variability, depending on uh, which uh, method you use. So essentially, this means that your result section should be a smooth function of the data. So it's a very good property to have. Let's look at examples. Those are four different ways of uh, plotting distributions. You can see that each of them dances differently. It's kind of interesting. The violin plot has a very interesting way of dancing, which, is, which means that the shape of a violin plot is both visually very salient and noisy, which probably means that if you take any of those plots individually, you will might misinterpret them. Box plots also have a nice way of dancing. They dance quite a lot. One of the reasons is that there is a mechanism in a box plot that uh, identifies extreme values as uh, outliers and displays them differently. So you can see here that uh, if you take, sometimes if you get take two data sets that, uh, that are very similar, those two data sets are almost exactly the same, you can get two very different plots and at least two different interpretations if you don't understand box plots that well. You might think that on the left, uh, okay, so negative values are kind of allowed. You know, I have some negative values, but if you look at the plot on the right, you might think, okay, uh, actually it's all positive values. This dot is just an outlier, it doesn't count. So box, box plots are not uh, very robust. Here's another example. It's something I did in a previous publication before I realized it was uh, not a good idea. I, um, and with colleagues, <laughs> uh, sorted um, interaction techniques according by descending accuracy, okay? But now imagine that, consider that each of those confidence intervals will, will dance separately across replications. And so the, the ordering will change all the time. And so this will be a very, uh, how would I say, jerky dance, right? very wide dance. So it's, it, it's probably it will be mis misinterpreted. So a way of making this more robust is by deciding in advance of the order in which I will report my confidence intervals, my results. So here, I made by doing that, I make my plot more robust and less misleading. Uh, last example, imagine you have those results, those five confidence intervals or credible intervals if you, if you like also. It doesn't matter here. So how do you interpret those? I think it's okay to say that A, there is, not events, there is not enough evidence to conclude that A is positive. You know. It's okay to say there is weak evidence or there is not enough evidence. I, it's actually very subjective. It's up to you how you interpret your individual intervals. But then if you say that, it's not okay to say that there is very strong evidence that B is positive. Why? Because A and B are not that different. You know? Imagine those two intervals dancing uh, independently, very often, a will end up uh, greater than B. So you're not being robust if you do that. A kind of better way of interpreting results it, it here is by grouping them. You can say, okay, for A, B, and D, we have 
some evidence that it's positive, and for C and E, we have very strong evidence. And the effect is likely uh, larger. And so I guess this will make some of you feel uncomfortable because it looks very subjective, right? And uh, at least much more subjective than what we're used to with those uh, procedures of, you know, looking at p-values, whether they're more or less than this alpha level, you know, applying corrections, all sorts of things. But I, it actually, I think it's the only way we can cope with uncertainty. We have to be subjective. It's our job as researchers to interpret our results the best we can. It's not something I think that can be automated easily or I at all. And so some uh, uh, methodologies b before already ma made this point that it's not up to us when we write a paper to decide whether the results are conclusive or not. Uh, it's something that we should let to uh, our readers. We should focus on prevent presenting the evidence as clearly as we can. Is a point that Fisher more than 60 years ago already made. This is a very nice quote. In so we, we have the duty of communicating our conclusions in, in t intelligible form, in recognition, uh, recognition of uh, the right of other free minds to utilize them in making their own decisions. So, uh, conclusions. So I painted a kind of depressing picture. <laughs> Uh, there's a sort of curse of statis in statistical analysis is that no matter what analysis you use, you will never get certainty. Um, for the same reason that you never get certainty with sample means. This reason is sampling variability, or more generally, a statistical error. Um, but there is a solution. You, we can embrace uncertainty, meaning that we can uh, try to understand it uh, as best as we can and, and communicate it as best as uh, we can in our papers. We try not to hide uh, the uncertainty in the data and the messiness of the data. And there is a very nice uh, paper, this, this reference, that explains that we have lots of incentive to uh, write, um, to have clean results. You know, people like reviewers like clean results, but that we should refrain from uh, uh, trying to present our results as cleaner uh, as they are. And of course, convey this uncertainty clearly. I, th I think maybe it's because I'm doing information visualization, but I think this means using plots and graphics. But also, I mean, it kind of doesn't make sense to convey uh, values numerically with lots of decimal places if those values are very unreliable. Right? The only reason why you might want to do that is when someone tries to replicate your analysis to verify that uh, they get the same results. But otherwise, communicate using plots. When you choose what's the best plot or how to interpret your data, always keep the density in, in mind and seek robustness, uh, which implies don't never dichotomize results into, for example, significant or non-significant. And uh, be nuan nuanced and use vague language. So that's also, for some reason, controversial. Um, you know, I get uh, sometimes reviews that say this is too sub vague. You know, your conclusions are too vague. I, I want something more clear. I think they're completely wrong, they just don't understand. Uh, they don't understand the point of uh, running uh, experiments and doing statistics. And actually there's this book, for example, a cool book that shows that a vague language is very important in reasoning, including in scientific reasoning. And so yeah, so focus on presenting your data as best as you can and let your readers judge by themselves. Uh, thank you, I'm happy to take questions.